recording. Um, so we are recording now. Um, and uh, let me get my introduction. All right. So yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. This is the fifth edition um, of our annual program, the Global Dialogue on Waste, where we bring some of the brightest minds to explore solutions uh, to and through waste management so that all of us could improve well-being on this planet. Um, uh, this is a pre-recorded event, um, and therefore uh, there will be no live engagement with the speaker. But if you have any questions, um, tweet, um, tweet them with the, the hashtag waste dialogue, which is W-A-S-T-E, waste dialogue is D-I-A-L-O-G, the American um, spelling. Um, or write to us at um, connect at wastewise.be and we will get your questions and comments answered. Now, this is the fourth event under the theme Beyond a Circular Economy, uh, where we are bringing practitioners and thought leaders from around the world to, um, to contribute uh, to a robust vision uh, for the circular economy. And um, today we have with us um, Alexander Lemel. Um, he is the founder of a circular economy um, consulting company called Wise Impact. And uh, through his uh, various publications, he argues that uh, poverty is the real waste. And therefore, if circular economy aims to address waste, then it should address poverty. And it is also a belief at Be Waste Wise that um, for circular economy to become a new economic paradigm um, by replacing the existing system, then it should address issues like poverty, like um, issues like unequal distribution of wealth and um, consumption and price on pollution. So we've discussed these issues earlier in, in this um, uh, through live events. And this one in this pre-recorded event, we'll be discussing about poverty and inequality. And um, hello, Alex. Uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Ways. Great to have you again. Uh, hello, Ranjit. Thanks for having me. Um, where are you joining from, Alex? Uh, where are you right now? Uh, right now, I'm uh, from uh, joining you from Northern France in Europe. OK. Uh, what are you doing there? Well, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing uh, business development there. And uh, the, the, the core of my business, which is mainly uh, impact assessment and uh, putting value on, on change uh, in projects, be it uh, linear or circular projects uh, today. Right. OK, great. Wonderful. Um, so um, Alex, could you tell us about, a little bit about um, where you're coming from, what your work is, and you know how you got into the circular economy movement, um, and um, and why you write so many articles on you know um, the inclusive um, for, for the circular economy on being more inclusive. What, what's the background for you know your um, fascination with poverty and why you, why you do this? Well, uh, the, the the background started. Uh, back in the years where I was at Cisco Systems and uh, based in, in Dubai, uh, where I saw the extreme capitalism system and uh, all the hidden, uh, the, the, the hidden issues that was uh, generated by having such a footprint uh, on the planet uh, because by living in a country uh, that use, uh, yet that use approximately uh, six to seven planets uh, per year. Uh, to enjoy the life uh, we were, we used to enjoy there. So I started the journey with an MBA, which I uh, which I did uh, partly in Boston, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, USA, uh, with electives in social innovation and uh, corporate social responsibility. I then became uh, an official trainer in those spaces, and I was part of a social entrepreneurship uh, association. Um, but at the end of the day, I was not very happy with with this concept because we needed to prove uh, that a social enterprise was really uh, making a difference on society. And we, uh, I, I saw that the corporate social responsibility angle of uh, the business was mainly a, a press release exercise, uh, other than really making the change. And when 
Cisco System decided to become the first funding organization to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I had the opportunity to be part of some uh, uh, web conferences and, uh, and meetings with uh, Dam Ellen MacArthur. And, and then I saw a really systemic uh, concept uh, that was really aiming at, at changing the way we do business today. So that's how I started back in 2011. Right. Um, so why poverty? Why your fascination with poverty? I mean, you um, make a point to mention that, um, you know, in all your articles and uh, all your talks. Well, um, besides Dubai, because Dubai was not the only experience I had, uh, I have lived extensively uh, in Africa. Uh, I have been traveling a lot for business and leisure in uh, in Asia, in the Middle East and in uh, in Africa. and not the standard business, uh, tourism, sorry, but uh, rather uh, uh, meeting with people and, and going, uh, going to meet the people and to see what's going on in each country that I was traveling uh, in. And uh, to, to be very surprised to see some big famous names and employing people uh, that were barely uh, living a decent life. And, in social innovation and in the, the, the traditional triple bottom line, which is not exactly the bottom line that we we should be aiming at today by splitting it in silos between the social, the environmental and, and the economic, but rather uh, a, a complete bottom line, uh, which needs to be addressed in, in one go. You, you cannot separate the environmental from the social and the economic. Um, I, I realized that uh, the way we were living in Western countries uh, was the wrong concept and was, the, was having a very negative impact on, on, on emerging economies and keeping some people uh, in poverty while uh, we were enjoying a, a very decent life. And uh, out of this triple bottom line, I'm the social guy. And the circular economy, to me, uh, should you be claiming the circular economy to be our next economic model? Then it has to be providing a hope for all of us. We live in this linear mindset where we are satisfied with the 1% owning nine, uh, the wealth equivalent to the rest of the 99% of the population of this world. And we seem to be continuing that mindset uh, in a circular economy as we, as we discuss it today with, by providing all the tools to the, the powerful uh, people and companies of this world. This is not a critic here. I'm just saying we need to be careful and we need to make sure that this new economic model has a social dimension. And why poverty? Well, basically, uh, if you understand well the butterfly diagram, the waste and the eradication of waste is at the center of the diagram between the, the biosphere and the technosphere. Therefore, we also need to address uh, the social dimension by starting with poverty at the center of the same diagram and by finding uh, strategies to also uh, embed the social dimension and, and eradicate poverty. I'm not saying this, is, this can be done very easily. I'm just saying in the business decision process, when we think about eradicating waste and when we think about implementing business models as a service, uh, mainly the performance economy, we need to understand how human beings uh, could play a critical role uh, by developing technologies that do not replace uh, human manpower, but that uh, emphasizes uh, this human manpower so that we can enjoy all kinds of activities that will be re rewarding the people on this planet. I'm not saying it's going to be jobs like eight to five as we know them today, but I'm saying this is, this, these are going to be rewarding based activities whereby manpower will be preferred over technologies at all costs. That's the, that's the reasoning behind circular economy 2.0. Right. right. So um, if I um, hear what you're saying, um, as, as someone who's been consulting for World Bank, I mean, I do come across poverty quite a bit. Uh, I think that's 
quite privileged because I'm coming across poverty not as someone who's experiencing it, but someone who's you know um, working on different environmental projects to solve it. Um, so, um, and um, and one thing I wanted to mention uh, when you were talking about Dubai was that um, you see all the flashy side of Dubai on one side. That's that's what most of us see. But then on the other side, it's um, the labor camps and the amount of poverty and the number the amount of exploitation that happens to be able to have this flashy um, lifestyle in Dubai, that's kind of generally not seen. And um, and if uh, so, so uh, that was one of my comments on, on Dubai and that kind of shows what kind of economic systems that we are in right now, the existing economic system that we're in. And if I hear you, um, what you're saying is that um, thanks to the foundation, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you believe that circular economy would be the next economic paradigm and if that's going to be the case, then um, you want to make sure that it may, uh, it also addresses the social um, issues like poverty. So it, that's where you're coming from, and and which is why you say that it's not a critique, just like you know this this yeah. theme that we're organizing here, but it's a way to make the vision more robust. Um, yeah, you you have you have two missing dimension in when I'm when I express the fact that. The concept is great. Uh, the circular thinking is great. Uh, this is the way to go, uh, except that it's not bold enough. It does because we we fear uh, we fear businesses. We 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 are still in our linear thinking, uh, whereby we rely on the big businesses to start kicking off that new economic model. But circular economy is a distributed economy. So it's like the sun, it's distributed. Everybody can enjoy uh, uh, technology based on uh, sun power, but prefer, be, uh, much, much better would be uh, uh, replicating uh, the photosynthesis uh, by natural biological uh, systems. What I'm saying is that we therefore need to address the two missing dimension of a systemic economic model, which is include everyone as part of this economic model, moving completely away from the linear thinking. So that's one, the social dimension is missing and we need to embed uh, business, circular business models by including uh, all the people when we design those models. And I will explain how uh, in a minute. And the second missing dimension is that we need to move away from our currency based system into a value-based system. I mean, Polanyi, the famous economist uh, uh, earlier in this century was explaining that this, the needs of the people needs to supersede uh, the, economic, the economy. So the social needs need to drive the economy and not the other way around. And by addressing the needs of the people so that they are satisfied and they don't need to consume more, uh, we could maybe avoid the rebound that uh, two, uh, two experts just issued in a report uh, a few weeks ago called uh, Circular Economy Rebound, whereby they say that in three quarters of the cases, uh, there, will be a, there will be a rebound. So we will be consuming more in a circular economy. Why? Because we still have this objective of developing uh, primary production and secondary production in parallel instead of uh, focusing on exclusive circular uh, production which is service-based production you use a product as a service in such a way that we keep that product the longest way possible in the economy uh, in order to reduce the, our consumption and right now the big guys are not advising to reduce consumption that's right. unfortunate that's, uh, that's, that's the way it is. Right, so um, this reminds me of a difficult question that I always have to deal with, um, and um, which is related to the increase in efficiencies when you know you have some kind of environmental models and it also has to, got to do with um, prices. Um, like you mentioned, you know, um, uh, they estimate, uh, they, they expect that there'll be a rebound in you know consumption because uh, if we go with more efficient processes but then doing more 
doing whatever we're doing right now more efficiently is a way in which we can you know improve the environment so uh, we come to a paradox where um what happens is if we have to provide services to more people then the services have to become cheaper right and uh, the products have to become more cheaper but then once that happens because of uh, improvements in uh, environmental uh, processes if that happens then all of a sudden the consumption increases and consumption as you know along with the population growth rate these uh, those two are the largest uh, one of the main drivers for all other anthropogenic uh, uh, changes on, on this planet so it comes to a paradox where you can't you either have to keep the price high um, or you have to um, like compromise on one of those things. I mean, do you ever think about it in this way? Am I thinking in the right way or should I be thinking about this in a different point of view? Like, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, my thoughts on this is that efficiency is, is great. Uh, we understand efficiency very well in a linear economy, but what we forget is effectiveness. The, the concept of effectiveness is that what we will do in a circular economy will come back again and again to satisfy the needs of the people, to satisfy the needs of the society, to increase well-being. By effectiveness, you, you just imagine your uh, sustainability loop, the endless loop. So let's take again the example of the sun. The, the, or the example of, of the, the, the water system or it comes back again and again. The, the sun is available, the sun energy is available every day. So that's effectiveness of your system. You need to replicate the natural cycles. Therefore, if you follow the slow cycles and if you develop bio-based or technological based solutions, you will not increase the consumption because you are based on, you, you mimic uh, natural cycles that comes back again and again. And that's effectiveness of the system associated with efficiency. Then you have, you have the, the right solution whereby you satisfy the needs of the people without putting more pressure on planet Earth because these elements are coming back again and again. And, I'm, and I know it's difficult in a fossil fuel and fossil based economy to understand that. But if you look at nature and how natural cycles uh, operates uh, this is the way this is the way we are we should be doing there is a great uh, example of a company called glowy and glowy is based on uh, luminescent uh, technology whereby they are now able to i believe uh, light lighting up uh, shops for uh, eight days in a row uh, with natural uh, lights so all of a sudden you move away completely from a fossil fuel mindset into a natural light which is available endlessly so your consumption should we should be able to think about consumption this way uh, by replicating uh, what we can learn from nature as one way right another concept would be the performance economy based on walter stahel uh, concept whereby you grant access to the same product that product for VIP customers like you and me uh, can evolve with the technology, okay? Uh, your washing machine can evolve uh, through the year, so you are VIP customers, you access the machine, you pay per wash, and that machine technology evolves through the years. Remember that technology, there are few rules to, uh, to use technologies in a circular economy. It has to absorb uh, CO2 emission. It has to reduce uh, uh, our footprint in, in such a way that we, we can use that, those technologies in closed loop without having putting pressure on resources. Um, and right. once, once we, uh, and we can access those, 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 those machines, uh, those products as a service, but for other people who cannot afford those, those services, you can imagine those machines, uh, technology is not evolving as fast as it, sh it would with us. Uh, and therefore decreasing the price of access to those technologies 
that in such a way your big machine brands in the world uh, now have these machines available uh, with the priority, with the objective of including more people into your economy. So therefore, even those machines as a service, they have been paid so many times over so many years that they could be now offered at a minimum price because the priority here is to include more people in your uh, economy uh, to avoid uh, all the negative externalities, uh, social externalities that we, we have to take into account uh, nowadays. Right, right. So um, you're talking about a service economy and uh, during our test room, we also talked about this. Um, this is a model which is similar to um, drug companies um, where um, in at least um, I know in India, um, drug companies can uh, pro uh, produce a drug with a patent on it for about, I think, 10 years. And after that, the patent, um, and after that, other companies can produce the same drug at a much uh, smaller cost and make it more, much more widely available. Uh, but I want to slightly um, uh, change gears here and then um, talk about uh, uh, talk about the status of you know what's happening in the circular economy. Uh, you've been very involved in this um, sector, so um, I know. The, the, so all of us know that the circular economy has gained a lot of traction. And um, a lot of companies have shown um, interest and support. Um, do you know, uh, you know, what's the status of implementation when it comes to implementing? What's the status? What do you see happening around the world? And who, who's doing anything or who's doing better? Or... You mean the status of implementation of circular economy project around the world, right? Uh, the concept of circular economy around the world. Or... Well, the concept of circular economy around the world is definitely gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a launch in, uh, in India, you just mentioned India six months ago by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, there are, they are now uh, circular economy uh, conference events, uh, co-working groups, uh, I would say in, the, in all five continents, uh, including Latin America and Africa. Uh, Lately, there was the first uh, circular economy conference in, in South Africa back in May and the first one in Latin America next week uh, in, in Uruguay. So the momentum is there. The thing is that it's like the, the industrial economy. It has all started uh, in the UK or in the Western world. Um, so that's that so far has been developed by uh, Western mindset, uh, which is which is fine to me. But the circular economy needs to address the needs of emerging uh, economies as well, because we are still in that paradigm of competition over resources instead of collaboration. And we will definitely have to change that uh, mindset, and we will have also to change the fact that. The Western economies are the model to follow uh, in the next century. Uh, the emerging economies are the societies that have understood, to me, to my point of view, uh, a great way of keeping uh, some great well-being and some uh, traditions. And in Africa, for instance, most of the economies are below uh, the global footprint of 2.8 uh, global hectare per, per habitant. And to me, it's a great, great advantage next to the way they collaborate between, between themselves. They have understood it all. So these two factors might see uh, continents like Africa or like Asia uh, much faster in your circular economic mindset than the Western economies that have to learn how to live in, in collaboratively away from uh, competing at all costs. So, we see a lot of, of examples uh, in Asia. The, uh, the ASEAN, ASEAN organization has issued a lot of examples uh, of what's happening in circular economy across, uh, across Asia. Uh, in Latin America, you now have two major conferences uh, organized in the coming months. So things are happening. Uh, Tier Fund, the NGO in the UK, has issued some example uh, to fight uh, poverty and to include the social dimension in the circular economic concept with business cases from brazil from africa so it's gaining momentum but what i'm saying is that 
we need to have this systemic view and we need to embed it all. And what I've been suggesting in that concept is maybe to, next to the biosphere and next to the technosphere, to include a human sphere where we will define the role of human being in that, in that next economy. Mm -hmm. So that we ensure that before jumping into uh, artificial intelligence and before jumping into the next, we believe will save the world, um, we tend to forget that it, it puts more pressure on resources, no matter what. Uh, instead, if you use human as a service and if you use human as resources to maintain the biosphere and to enhance the biosphere, to maintain the technosphere and to improve it, uh, therefore you increase the role of human being in your next economic model and you you think about the human sphere before moving into uh, how the technosphere will will sort us out and how the humans are going to a bit like the model that was taken in the book um, uh, cradle to cradle with the ant the ants uh, that weight more than the than you, all human beings put together and the ants are rebuilding the biosphere they have no negative impact on the biosphere they are instead rebuilding it how can we transform humans and human activities so that it could rebuild the biosphere and as well as preserving the technosphere? One great example is those ladies in China that are pollinating by hand uh, all the fruit trees in, uh, in the Sichuan uh, regions of China. That's a basic example, but that's a great example of replacing the bees that we have uh, killed by our, uh, our uh, pesticides and, and all the processes that, uh, that we've implemented in the linear economy. While we are rebuilding the, the population of bees, how the humans can preserve that biosphere, fixing it, while we are trying to, uh, to fix the population of bees. That, that's, that's a great example. So beyond that, that example, how can we join DLU, this uh, Chinese-American uh, 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 filmmaker and, uh, and perma permaculture expert has rebuilt, uh, has uh, recreated uh, ecosystems in desert, uh, turning them into lush, uh, lush forest with rivers. So we can rebuild the biosphere uh, from the human by the human. So this is possible. So integrating that human sphere uh, into the butterfly diagram would be, in my view, a way to understand how we can enhance the role of humans in that next economic model before jumping into technology will save us all. And that's also a way to, as we said earlier in this uh, discussion, to see uh, how to use, uh, to optimize all the resources, including the human resources, to fix our economy and to fix our planet uh, while eradicating, seeing the end of poverty together with seeing the end of, uh, of waste. Right, so um, th that um, brings me to a point which we've been making on um, the global dialogue, so through Be Waste Wise um, in the past four and a half years. And uh, I'm an engineer, I, you know, I work with technology all the time. But then um, we say that technology does not, like, like you said, you know, does not um, solve, or does not end uh, or does not save the human human race or life on, on this planet because um, it is after all uh, it, uh, it is after all a tool and it will help us do something faster better more efficiently but then it itself does not have a um, intention or um, it depends on the person or the group of efficiently people. but not effectively right exactly yeah, so um, it, it does not, um, uh, it depends on the person or the group of people who are using that technology on what the technology finally does. Um, so uh, we are at this point, I think, looking for uh, a shift in how we think about resources, a um, uh, shift in, uh, in the, our mind frameworks on how we think about uh, our planet and well being. Um, so let me ask you. Um, about uh, you, so we've talked about the theory on how um, you know what we should do and how we should include poverty in the circular economy framework. But do you have any examples on uh, 
how this could be done? Like, do you have any examples from your work where, you know, let's say there is a business which is trying to be more circular in their uh, supply chains or in, the, in their materials and using their materials, but how you could include the human uh, aspect um, to it? Do you have any examples that uh, you could, you know, help our listeners understand what you're saying? Well, the, um, in terms of the best examples, I mean, just uh, just at my at my company level, uh, it's difficult to to address these these major topic uh, just by myself. But uh, I'm just suggesting here that there is a way to be a bit bolder in the the way we think about circular economy and the next the next model. Uh, in terms of example, the best examples today are the ones published in the two reports from Tier Fund, uh, that NGO, and that has a report called uh, the cl Closing the Loop. And I can send you, uh, send you the references and the, the, the report themselves. One is called Closing the Loop, and uh, the other one is called the Virtuous uh, Circle. This is, to my knowledge, the two reports focusing on cir how circular economy could uh, eradicate uh, poverty, or at least have a huge impact on societies across the world. Um, so that's that's for the examples. Uh, in terms of uh, my work and where this is all going, well, my work is mainly on measuring projects, services, and possibly products uh, impact on society. Okay, I, I work on impact assessment uh, report. And I put a value on change, whether you have a linear product compared to a circular uh, services, uh, how that circular services will enhance society. How are we going to be satisfied uh, by that circular services? What, uh, whether that circular services will generate more well-being uh, to the targeted population. That's, that's the work I do. What kind of metrics do you Obviously, use? The, match, the metric, obviously, I work more on linear project and circular projects today, but the conclusion of these reports always tend to help uh, the designer of those projects and programs to focus more on circularity. Uh, in terms of metrics, well, there are many metrics available out there, so I don't need to recreate the metrics. Uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation issued some metrics. Uh, other designers and, uh, and organizations have issued uh, circular economy uh, indicators. So these indicators are there, available. But I don't come up with a, uh, a wallet full of indicators because it doesn't work that way. You need to first understand what the beneficiary of your services or the customers, the employees, the citizen of your services the way they react to your services, whether it generates uh, better well-being, uh, better satisfaction, more confidence, uh, less consumption patterns, and so on and so forth, whether it addresses their needs. So once you un understand uh, what type of change is happening on, the, on your targeted population, then you list potential indicators. So often they are quantitative indicators, but we need as well uh, to list qualitative indicators. So whether you are more satisfied with the circular service as it is designed today, what kind of, of change does it create uh, in your daily life? So it's, it has to do a lot to do with qualitative uh, outcomes. And once we understand those outcomes, we list as many indicators, quantitative and qualitative as possible. So you pick them up from circular economic indicators that have been designed by experts, but you also pick them up from well-being indicators and qualitative indicators. And once you have proven that change, that change is really happening, that that circular project is generating more well-being and more satisfaction than the linear uh, product and on top of that it has a lesser footprint and it, it it is based on the circular economic principles and i i also have suggested to list uh, a list of outcomes priority outcomes based on the butterfly diagram which is available uh, on on linkedin it's called optimizing circular value so once you understand all those priority outcomes you put measurement uh, indicators in front of them you prove that they they are happening that 
circular economic rebound is avoided, that satisfaction has increased, and then you, you apply a value uh, on that change. So what we do is that we, we estimate the opportunity cost, avoided cost, all the externalities that are, uh, that are monetized, and we explain to management of companies, to governmental teams, that these services is providing these benefits, is avoiding this kind of rebound, is diminishing the, the consumption overall. And we provide as well ways to uh, redesign uh, that, that service or programs uh, in, the, in the future by uh, doing a sensitivity analysis now that we have a lot of data available. So that's, that's how we do it. Right now, one final question is, um, so uh, for circular economy to work, I mean, businesses, I mean, it started as a business movement. I mean, businesses are, should be a um, part of it. But um, when it comes to, um, so for, if a CEO of a business, if, if he has to um, um, convince his shareholders that, you know, this is a path that we should take, then, you know, what are the drivers um, that a company would do something like this? I, I know savings could be a big driver, but are we there yet where uh, taking these steps would create a lot of savings for the company? And um, also, in addition to savings, what are the drivers that a CEO could, uh, you know, factors that a CEO could use to convince their shareholders, you know, uh, who are mainly investing in the, in the company? Mostly for yeah, the the, the savings mindset uh, is obviously the the mindset we we see today in a in a linear economy where we try to uh, to reduce cost as much as we can and sell uh, sell as many products as we as we can. That's that's your uh, output uh, output process. But um, uh, the in your circular economy, the advantage is that. Now it's not about saving uh, the last penny, it's about innovating. It's about how am I going to shift around my business model? How am I going to turn on its head uh, the way my organization functions in order to innovate and to innovate together with other companies so that I come up with a collaborative uh, solution to externalities, environmental externalities, social externalities, so that we can innovate and come up with a solution that removes those externalities from, uh, from the system. Those externalities could be a threat uh, to the existence of businesses. So circular economy is about explaining to businesses uh, the best way uh, to save businesses uh, from, from disappearing. That's as simple as that. If you continue putting pressure on the planet the way we do it, in a, with, uh, by adding three, three more billion consumers uh, that will all want to live that uh, lush life uh, that we see on TV, and therefore we will put so much pressure on the, uh, on the earth that at the end of the day, your businesses will run out of water, will run out of uh, fossil uh, to, 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 to make the product and uh, we run out of energy. So if you don't come up with this mindset shift of circular thinking by saying, how am I going to address the next ex externality? How am I going to address my water supply in an effective way and my energy supply differently from the fossil fuel mindset? Uh, your, your business might well be uh, disappearing. So yeah. it's not only uh, it's not only a concept that generates so many innovation for the future of your company, right. it's also a survival concept. Yeah, so uh, this, this works for um, large um, companies, you know, which have uh, um, uh, interest in um, staying, uh, staying in business for, you know, um, hundreds of years. Uh, but um, how does it work uh, for small and medium enterprises who are, who are dealing with much different challenges? I mean, uh, they're actually thinking about next month, next, you know, getting revenues in the short term so that they could survive um, longer. So um, what kind of drivers or what's happening in the small and medium um, business sector with, with respect to circular economy and what they could do? So we have only five more minutes. So, you know, um, you could uh, maybe answer to this question about small and medium enterprises and circular economy. 
and also have if you have any conclusions you know you could uh, conclude with those so basically i mean you have a lot of startups uh, that jump straight into the circular economic uh, models so they, these are very dynamic uh, startups like uh, bundle in the Netherlands uh, that just come up with a, a, a service-based solution uh, to turn the product into a service. So these are great concepts and these are very fast solutions that are shaking up uh, the industry and these, these are good news. Uh, obviously the large companies are, are already being addressed by uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the, the World Economic Forum. These are large organizations helping those large companies uh, figure out how to innovate uh, in, the, in this next economy. The SMMEs are not being addressed as we speak. There is no organization, to my knowledge, or very few only, that help the SMMEs uh, address, uh, embrace this next economic model. And we need, we need an organization, be it uh, at national or in international level, that drives those uh, small to medium-sized uh, enterprises to talk to each other, to collaborate between each other, and to come up with comprehensive uh, service-based solutions so that they can create and address uh, the consumer needs uh, in, in clever ways by saying, I'm missing that, that piece of the puzzle uh, in order to offer uh, the service to my, uh, to my consumer, or I'm, I'm missing uh, one technology or one solution. Can we, can we work together uh, with different comprehensive solutions so that uh, put together, this could be a very innovative uh, new approach. So the SMMEs, the advantage of the SMMEs is that they are locally based. So in a distributed economy, this is what we want and that's what we, we need. So the circular economy is the economy of so small to medium sized enterprise, but today they are not being helped to uh, flourish in such an, an economy. So that's in my view missing. Mm -hmm. And that's in my view, the solution the, the foundation to our uh, next economic model. That's going to be a localized, uh, localized enterprise delivering a service to the, to the urban uh, hub uh, instantly, basically. So that's, uh, that's missing, unfortunately. But collaboration is the key, uh, the key element here for SMMEs. And there is a need of having an, this organization as a glue to put uh, the right the right SMMEs to talk to each other, like we do in industrial uh, ecology and symbiosis, basically. Right. The same, same approach. Right. Great. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that there is this circular economic model brings, brings us hope because we see a lot of uh, surveys about the CO2 pressure, the recent surveys saying that there is 1% chance to uh, to be uh, below the 1.5 degree at the end of the century, 5% uh, uh, below 2 degrees. We all know that at 2 degrees, the, the world will be, uh, will be a very, uh, very difficult place to, to live in. Uh, and if you have children, uh, they will turn uh, 70, 75 by the end of this century. Uh, therefore, uh, your children will not be able to, to live that life that uh, we all enjoyed so far. So, Circular economy brings proper answers to reducing CO2 pressure by innovating, by thinking circularly. What I'm just saying is that we need to be careful that circular economy is designed for every single human being on this planet. We are all hearing uh, by the big international organization that the future is about a jobless growth. These are two terrible worlds. The future is not about jobless growth. The future is about advancement, human advancement. And it's about how to find ways to use human as a resource, as energy, as service, so that we can all live a very well-being uh, and enjoyable life. And jobless growth is not going to be the future we all wish to have, because those who are saying that are just thinking that technology will save us all. Again, 
we are running out of resources, so technologies are based on those resources. Therefore, this is a limited way of thinking. On the other hand, we have plenty of people. We are going to 10 plus billion people in this planet. So how are we going to use the, them as energy and services and resources to fix uh, the, the many challenges that we foresee uh, by the end of the century? So that's, I believe, another dimension that we need to think together with being measured against value creation. And that's that's if you if you manage to embrace these two two additional dimension, you have now a future with a lot of hope. And it maybe sounds a bit utopian, but we all need a bit of utopia in our life. Uh, but if you understand biomimicry, natural cycles, permaculture, blue economy uh, very well, then the regenerative economy, especially how do you regenerate uh, resources? You can hear what I'm saying about using human more intelligently. And one great example uh, to end this conversation is the X tax project, which is asking governments, it's starting in Europe, but hopefully it will uh, spread across the world, to remove tax on manpower or to at least diminish uh, dramatically tax on manpower and to increase tax on fossil fuel and fossil based uh, products. And that's to me one great pathway towards this circular economy 2.0 concept. Great. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, so um, this reminds me of something. Um, I, I uh, always, um, I think when I was really young in my teenage, uh, teenage years, um, I think back then I knew that I wanted to be in the environmental field um, because uh, when uh, in my teenager years I was still part of the future generation for, at that point of time, but I was already thinking about my future generations and you know what will happen to them. Uh, and um, I always wanted to be in the environmental field, and I think I'm living my dream now. So you know I'm an environmental consultant, and um, as part of this, I spent um, I worked. Um, for quite a while in Abu Dhabi, um, not very far from Dubai, where where you worked, and um, and my work there. I, I mean, Abu Dhabi. I mean, it just blew my mind when I went there. I mean, it's so amazing, you know. So um, the hotels or the everything that they do is just so amazing. It, it just blew my mind. The buildings and everything, and um, and. My work was um, I go to different companies and then audit them for their uh, environmental footprint, for their waste footprint, and then um, see you know what kind of footprint they are having, how they could reduce costs, how they could um, reduce their footprint on the environment. And uh, that was my job. And as part of the job, um, I also looked at, um, for example, construction companies and um, and we also, when looking, when when performing an audit of the construction company, we also had to look at all of their facilities, and some of their facilities also included um, labor camps. So um, uh, I also used to visit labor camps quite often uh, to audit, the, you know, the construction facilities and the living conditions there. I'm not sure if you've ever been to one of them, but the living conditions there are. Um, terrible you, you just can't imagine and these are immigrants from some other country coming to this country to work there and these companies are um have them living in those conditions and um i used to keep thinking so i'm working on waste management i'm working on environmental impact so let's imagine now let's just conduct a thought experiment right so let's imagine abu dhabi um transitions from fossil fuels to um renewable energy um which there is a huge potential for it to do that, um, but um, it looks like the, the 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 speed is not as fast as we we expected while I was there. But still, let's let's consider that um, Abu Dhabi uh, or the entire UAE moves to renewable energy, and then the systems, the material flows are much more circular. Let's assume. Let's get to that point. And now, in that situation, in that uh, utopian future, if that was happening, and the people who are working on this were still living in labor camps. You know, is that a future that you know we would like to be a part of? 
you know, I started as an environment consultant, that would be the best, uh, well, the part where there are circular flows and renewable energy, that would be the best future that I could hope for. But then on the other hand, um, people are not living in very good conditions. The people who built all of this are not living in very good conditions. So, uh, I mean, that's the question that keeps, uh, you know, um, uh, keeps uh, turning me more towards not just being an environmental consultant, but also being very conscious of the societal impacts that we're having and, you know, what kind of future that we need. And I think this is a question that all of us should ask, whether that is a future that we want to actually live in. And um, some of them, some of us might think that, you know, oh, Abu Dhabi is uh, an extreme example. And it is an extreme example of our current system. But then um, if you actually look at um, look at it, look at what we're doing around the world, it is just the extreme example. Um, not very different from what we're doing, but it's just the extreme. So we're all doing it and we have to really think about um, how we do this and what kind of future that um, yeah. we will so yeah, with that I think um, yeah, we are out of time. I, I I wasn't expecting this towards the end. So okay, no, yeah. just just to to address your point. I mean, Abu Dhabi, Dubai are uh, the example that you you just mentioned. But the thing is that you make other other cities dream to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and Lagos wants to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Cairo wants to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And you name it, I mean, the number of cities who, which wants to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, Addis Abeba. But imagine billions of African, Asian, Latin Americans who wants to be like Dubai. I mean, where are we going to end up this way? So instead, let's make sure that these collaborative societies show the way to the rest of the world, how to collaborate, how to live uh, a decent life uh, by, by sharing uh, resources, by using and optimizing all these resources in clever ways by reinventing uh, the next economic model based on the circular thinking, but not to forget the social dimension because Europe will move fast in a circular economic model that's fine for the VIP uh, people, uh, the citizens of Europe, but, um, but they will still see those migrants, economic migrants coming to Europe and not understand the relation between the way they, cons the, the, they consume and why we have so many uh, Africans and the people from the Middle East migrating to Europe. There is a disconnect and that disconnect needs to be fixed if we want circular economy to be the next economic model. Right, great. Um, I think we should end um, this session here. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, certain people, when we're we're all really busy people, you know, working on our areas of expertise, and certain people say, oh, so should circular economy also worry about all these other problems when we are doing trying to do something else? And this was a question that I asked to one of our uh, future uh, panelists, uh, Olivia Lapierre. She talks about how uh, the conversation on environmental sustainability should be more diverse, should also include the populations which will be more affected by um, such uh, uh, by climate change. And I asked the same question. So we're already working on all these other issues. So, so should we also talk about, uh, should we also worry about representation of different populations? And then she says, you don't have to really choose between identities. Like, you know, if you're a, uh, uh, if you're an environmental engineer, it doesn't mean that you stop being an Indian, an immigrant in a different country. So, um, so I thought that was really interesting, and I think we should all, like you know, don't have to choose between different uh, identities or different visions. Yeah. No, you you need to address address the needs of the people uh, to make sure that the people are, are are satisfied with their life where they are. Okay fixing the population where they are. I mean, if they, the population wants to move, they, they, they want to move, but as long as it's it's not an economic move or a poverty-based move. Uh, addressing the needs of the people and in such a way that it's effective, i.e. there is no more footprint. We uh, develop solution that addresses the needs of the people without having any externalities uh, and moving us away. The footprint concept is a linear concept. Uh, in circular economy, since you are in a regenerative economic model, there's no more footprint. So you satisfy the needs of the people 
in an effective way, in an efficient way, so that they it's constantly regenerative. You constantly bring them water, food, uh, energy based on renewable systems that not only are renewable but provide even more abundance. Like like in nature, if you if you if you leave your garden uh, without being maintained, nature will take over and. Uh, the, the insects and the, 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 the trees will come back. So yeah. abundance exists in nature and we don't understand that as human beings. And there is a way to do that. Obviously, it will take time to reach that um, abundance and regenerative level, but we need to start. Right, right. Yeah, great. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, thanks for your um, extra time. Uh, this discussion did um, go a little longer than expected. So um, we will try to um, publish the entire discussion. But um, uh, in case if you have to edit, we will um, let you know uh, what parts will be edited. So yeah, great. Thank you, Alex. Um, thanks everyone for listening. And if you have any questions, this is a pre-recorded interview, so you'll not be able to engage live with the speaker. But if you have any questions, um, tweet to us with the hashtag Waste Dialogue. Waste Dialogue is W-A-S-T-E-D-I-A-L-O-G. Or you could also write to us at uh, connect at wastewise.be and we'll get your questions and comments answered. So thank you again and um, please uh, watch the other, um, please uh, make sure you register for the other um, themes that are happening which are practicing waste management um, and also collective action. Um, so yeah, thank you very much and uh, have a good day, good evening, good night. Thank you. <laughs>